So, hello and welcome everybody to our today's uh, webinar, to Argus and Symphony. I hope uh, you can hear me well. To make ticket exchange with models like Taesi, KPM, Stark and Co. And uh, yeah, we will bring that topic to you a little bit closer with regards to our integration platform, Argus and Symphony. My name is uh, Ralf Dimke. I'm responsible for sales and marketing Argosense. And um, with me in the webinar, we have Christian Middle. He is uh, responsible for services and product development, and he will guide you through the product demonstration today. So the agenda for today we have prepared, um, just a few words about Argosense, then this will be followed up with uh, a few few slides about our product and especially the topic of data exchange more in general. And then we will uh, see a live demo of Symfony itself together with uh, also live uh, data exchange between Glass and Jira and the BMW KAC portal. And um, at the end, we will answer all your questions you have raised during the webinar or at the end of the webinar. So hopefully we can answer all of your, of your questions there. A few words about Argosense. Um, we have founded the company in 2009, specialized in tool integration and data exchange. In uh, about 2013, we decided not to have only single product strategy. So we brought um, an additional solution to the market for traceability and requirements management called Argosense Fidelia. And what we think what uh, really is beneficial and uh, for, for our customers especially is that we all, all our employees have really uh, strong expertise with all the leading ALM tools. Of course, we are integrating all these different tools and it's really really necessary not only to know how they are working but also know behind the scenes a little bit of technology and have an understanding of apis and how the tools really are functioning in the end now we have a strong representation in the automotive industry you will see that on the next slide would be if about 40 50 percent of our customers are either um, oems or first or second tier suppliers um, which we believe we have left a quite good footprint in the last 10 years there. And uh, last, last but not least, very important for us from the beginning was that our product development is really focused on, on marketing customers. So the feedback we get from, from our customers uh, really will, will go back into the product and, and bring the product forward and, and uh, leads us into the creation of new features and stuff like that. So this is always very welcome and um, of course we will reflect that. So here you can see a um, subset of our customer base. Um, of course, the most, I would say the most significant ones are with the biggest brands um, will show up here. And if there is a necessity for you or if the wish, uh, the, the wish from you that you want to have a contact to one of our customers before you may decide for one of our products, um, just let us know. And usually most of them really are willing to, to talk to new customers or prospects uh, of our sense. That's not really an issue. So let's uh, jump to what kind of offering in general we have. So we have uh, two basic solutions. One is uh, Symphony, um, which can be used for ALM tool integration and also for automated B2B data exchange, what we are looking into more depth today, of course. And our second product, as I mentioned, August and Fidelia. This is a platform for requirements management, very change oriented. Um, and uh, also suitable for traceability across tools. So what on the one hand side Symfony is doing behind the scenes that could also be made visible with uh, Fidelia, for example, in the, in the front end and uh, as a separate tool. But today we just will talk about uh, Argosense Symfony. If there is any interest in Fidelia, just let us know and we can make a separate session 
with you in person um, separately. Um, just to cover the tool integration part of it, so um, basically um, what you see behind all these different bubbles here for test management, requirements management, change management, and so on, we call that domains. Behind these domains, there are the respective tools which are on the market, and Symfony is more or less kind of a bus system which then can connect all the tools which are covered now by these um, by these domains, so that at the end each tool can really talk to each other with all the other tools. Um, and it's not only, let's say, um, a basic uh, basic attribute mapping style, it's also very customizable, the kind of how the tools are talking to each other. We'll come to that a little bit later. And most of our customers, they seriously call back of breed support when they are more or less cherry picking the best tools which is which are suited for them behind these domains. So a certain tool for test management, another tool from another vendor, maybe for requirements management and so on. So this is what what's under the umbrella of best of breed is, is, is covered. Um, nevertheless, we have a lot of customers which are using these more large um, enterprise uh, um, ALM platforms like uh, PTC Integrity or um, however they are all called. But in the end, it turned out that um, many of our customers, they are not using all the aspects, for example, for requirements management, they use a different tool that's maybe incorporated into the ALM platform or they the ALM platform does not support modeling features, so there's also connections necessary to that kind of domain. So there's, um, even if customers are not really in the best of three, and we are, they still have a lot of um, need for integration. And especially, of course, where they all come together is then um, with talk of data exchange. So for that we use this, the same product, of course, um, it's just a little bit different way of uh, say, interacting um, not only with uh, internal hosted tools. So here we really, um, if customer opens his network to retrieve data from external sites, then they are they are able to uh, exchange that uh, data with, for example, customers or other suppliers or development partners or whatever. In different ways. So usually what we are supporting uh, at the moment are portals um, for different uh, which are offered for the, for the suppliers of uh, for example BMW, Daimler, Porsche, Volkswagen and so on. Some of the OEMs uh, they have uh, a simple maybe a, a Jira front end where, where uh, suppliers can connect to. Of course that will be supported. Um, in the same way, um, or some they are using kind of a file-based approach um, where they, for example, use files in ASAM format or maybe other XML or um, maybe also Excel formatted uh, files. So this is all possible, of course, also with the platform here. So going a little bit deeper into that use case, so what do we typically see in that situation? So of course, development cycles decrease and decrease. So everything has to go faster. Um, um, quality and security requirements increase at the same time. So of course, this is something which is a kind of an opposite <laughs> argument here. Um, so integration between OEMs and suppliers is, is really uh, going stronger and stronger. Um, at the same time, of course, there, there must be something um, which is really uh, taking the jobs from, from, from them so that they can really automate stuff and uh, really can leverage the, the coordination uh, efforts a little bit. What is also very, very uh, important is uh, that communication is really, really in time um, about error fixing so that development can go, can go on rapidly, of course. So what uh, happens then, uh, what we see in the market is that uh, the OEMs provide so-called supplier portals uh, where they can connect to either, they can have kind of a batch access via an API or data exchange like we just discussed before, 
And sometimes um, they also get a direct web interface, so where the developers from the supplier can put in their uh, their stuff, their bug reports and error reports by hand. But I believe, or we believe, that's not very uh, very useful. And why we'll see, of course, in the following slides as well. So from a technical perspective, um, we have usually on both sides, suppliers and OEM, usually then if everybody has agreed on um, certain products and, and all the paperwork is done, then the OEM places the order to the supplier for maybe developing kind of a control unit. A supplier starts development, um, makes his own internal testing, and of course, the supplier that usually they have their own, you have their own change or defect management system like an Atlas in Jira, IBM RTC, whatever, um, to collect all your 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 um, um, uh, data here, uh, which for the test results and the bug reports and everything. Um, and at a certain point in time, you will deliver a sample uh, to the OEM and they themselves do their own testing, maybe integration testing, maybe component testing, whatever. So they also have their own defect management system, of course. So now if they find any issues, they want to uh, want to hand them over again to you so that they can or to the supplier so that they can be fixed. And usually they use the portal for that. And there they put either the data in the XML based format, or they open that up with kind of a REST API or other kind of API, which then translates or retrieves the data from their defect management. So this is basically the situation. And now the interesting part is how can the data uh, go back and forth between supplier and OEM? And this is what we want to talk about. So that means the OEM usually determines the technical connection. Either they have at the time they have the Dante and the Stark portal, BMW has its own portals, Porsche, Volkswagen, and so on and so on. Some have uh, direct tool access, like I mentioned before. Um, some uh, more sophisticated one, I would say, or maybe a little bit uh, followed by a little bit more implementation effort via OFTP and a kind of a file format in the back end and so on. So different things and everything is possible here. And of course, they determine usually also the processes. So that means the workflow rules, how data is synchronized, attribute mappings and stuff like that. Usually they have a kind of an onboarding document um, where everything is written down. And um, yeah, then as next, point, so to say, from a process perspective, the supplier has to align his uh, workflow or his state transition model and his um, say, uh, data model in his uh, workflow or defect management tool with the tool of the OEM. So this is a basic uh, example, how it is used, for example, at BMW. So you see the different synchronization points in red. Um, and the different states and the state transitions um, which are possible. So this is a very simplistic one that could be much more complex, of course. And there can be much more, let's say, use cases. This is just one for a new defect. Um, there's, there are use cases for maybe defects created by the supplier and um, um, reported to the OEM, or there are Maybe we have duplicate defects. Uh, how, how do we care about that? So there are different use cases which have to be considered. And usually, as I said, it's, this is determined by uh, the OEM. Well, what are the solution requirements um, from the process perspective again? Um, of course, the coordination of the OEM given uh, workflows with the supply internal workflows or straight state transition models, they have to be uh, aligned. And of course, um, both parties have to agree and align on the data and field mappings. And uh, let's say the more basic things like um, the reaction times, um, synchronization intervals, and everything has to be has to be agreed with uh, with the two parties. And that, of course, all of that should be reflected uh, in an, in the solution uh, after that. So then, 
so that uh, in best case everything can be run completely automated and both parties they just can concentrate on working on, on their own internal tools, so to say. So again, from the technical connection, what is required is uh, one is um, an ad adaptation to the portal itself, so to the API or understanding uh, the file formats. Then of course, um, the goal always is to have everything automated completely to really reduce manual interaction or to get rid of it completely. And um, one requirement always was uh, from more from the supplier side that regardless of what kind of automation um, is used, it should be independent from the tracking or man change management tool used because there's a lot of change. Um, very often um, there is a tool established that maybe gets replaced by something different and um, also the synchronization product itself solution should reflect that probability also. And of course, uh, everything should be really scalable. So we have, of course, we have situations and projects where there's a very low volume of exchange happening, but also we have suppliers which have uh, all known OEM as customers and with each customer, they have a lot of projects. So it really has to scale in terms of exchange intervals, but also for, for high data volumes with a lot of maybe, maybe uh, file attachments and stuff like that. So this should also be considered as a requirement, of course. So um, Symphony reflects and uh, responds to these requirements um, with a certain kind of architecture. So what we are doing here uh, is that we, we have created for all the different um, portals and also for all the different tools which are common on the market, so-called adapters. These adapters are more or less um, normalizing the data format and the syntax um, of the APIs, um, which we are connecting to directly for the tools or for the, for the portals. So that internally, um, then we have really only, let's say, one, one language we, we are uh, talking to. Uh, and so we can connect all the different tools with each other like, like the customer needs it. So if it's a JIRA with a TIA or maybe at the same at the same time, customers not only connected to Tabesi or to Dante and to Volkswagen KPM, no problem. We can uh, we can reflect that with different um, so-called um, configuration sets. Um, it's just a configuration part of it. Um, then the customer has different so-called um, configuration modules for say for the administration, for the configuration itself, for the attribute mapping, for the scheduling and everything, uh, which is the uh, case which we will see later on. And very important, as I said, there are really unlimited um, possibilities of integration scenarios. So they could you could integrate Jira with CodeBeamer or with ALM, and at the same time you can connect to Dante and Taesi, and you really can connect each and everything with each other here in the platform. That's a very nice thing. And um, customers are really um, completely independent also from the tools themselves which are behind so usually we are always ahead of uh, adapting to new versions that means if you are for example using class and and there's a new version coming uh, where they have made any changes in, in the api um, you just update uh, to the latest adapter version and then update jira and everything can be done on the on the fly without uh, uh, bringing down any system, um, so we are always ready for, for updates here. And um, last but not least from, from that slide here, uh, what you uh, see here with these process templates, so usually um, yeah, tool integration or data exchange is, is not only um, a kind of a, a attribute mapping, so there's also a lot of process uh, within which we already have seen in the previous slide and this is something um, awful for these things which are given by the OEMs where we already have ready-built 
templates uh, which give us the uh, possibility to really very very quickly um, adapt um, to your specific situation and your specific tool uh, in order to implement then such synchronization situations and um, on top of that um, if you should have some kind of tool internally which is uh, not maybe really common or where we do not have an adapter for we offer our um, development uh, system we call that adapter framework also to our customers so you can also create own adapters based on Argos and Symfony which then can be connected with this this complete uh, integration world here as well um, from that process template perspective, again, um, what you can see here that is, uh, yeah, that, that we really can build the business logic, um, which is um, um, uh, important for that, for these data exchanges. And uh, this is something, as I said, we are doing with templates. You can also adjust these templates uh, for, your, for your own specifics, but usually what we have seen is that is, this is really not necessary. So um, through the uh, experience we have made in, in, in these long years now, um, the templates are getting uh, better and better and filled with all this information and experience. So usually there's not much to do from that perspective. So coming back to our uh, slide from before. So ideally then on the supplier side, we would implement Argus and Symphony with uh, the correct adapters for the specific OEM here on that side, then uh, the data will be processed <clears throat> through the platform itself and will then be uh, brought into your um, or the supplier specific change management. So where then it can be can be worked uh, same the same way back that the data will for example, for the resolution and 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 uh, or resolution times, all this information then can flow back to to the uh, OEM as well. And as I said, this can be quite complex, and I think uh, Argus and Symphony gives you very very good means um, to reflect that complexity. Of course, um, you as a supplier, you probably do not have only one customer. Um, so there will be more than one customer and with all these customers or with one single customer you probably will not have only one project or control systems or whatever so that will be different as well and uh, you can imagine if if you use some kind of self-written scripts or whatever um, or, uh, then this could be really 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 complex to maintain so a solution with Argus and Symphony really gives you everything you need to customize and to configure all this uh, complexity within the product itself. And it can also uh, be even more complex if you think that suppliers also have suppliers by themselves. So these can also be integrated into that complete workflow here. So before I hand over to Christian, just as a summary regarding uh, the advantages we see for our customers with Symphony. Of course, uh, you have a consistent data storage on both ends. Um, this is very important. So the actual information is really always available at any time, um, at, at least at the points in time which uh, everybody has agreed to for the synchronizations. Um, far less coordination efforts uh, between customer and uh, and OEM or, or and supplier definitely because everything really is just coordinated once and then everything runs um, in the background invisible for developers for example so they do not need to have a different web interface or any kind of different tools where they have to have to store data maybe uh, double time so that they have to uh, input data twice or whatever in different systems so everything is really um, cared about symphony so this really reduces uh, sources of error um, and in the end then results in less costs um, for because the developers really they can concentrate on, on development and maybe on their internal system and do not really have to care about any other external or third-party system here 
as I said, the implementation is very quick um, with the help of our templates and the configuration options we have. And um, as a last point, which is also very important, is uh, that it's really um, uh, um, supporting large, large amounts of data at the same time also um, provides fail-safe operation modes uh, with, our, with our Symfony server setup. Yeah, again, from portal and format perspective, we already have talked about that. So we are supporting different, all the different portals, all the different formats which are usually used and the different tools. And of course, you can use Symfony also for synchronization of data between the tools themselves here. Okay, so uh, if you have any questions in the meantime, don't hesitate to, uh, to type them in so that we don't forget anything. Um, in the meantime, I will hand over to Christian. So just a second. I just need to make him as an organizer or moderator, and then he should be able to share his screen now. Thank you, Ralph. So I will quickly um, quickly show um, a lot of the aspects that Ralph has been talking about in terms of the product itself. So um, on my environment here, we have uh, Symfony running in its latest version. I do have um, Atlas and Jira running it's on that end. And I'm connected. Um, I'm connected to the TIZ development environment. Um, Symfony itself has a browser-based uh, interface uh, for all the configuration that is needed. So um, the components that I have installed is the TZ adapter itself, uh, Jira adapter, uh, both of which are responsible to um, establish the technical connection to TZ or to Jira. Um, the other component that I have installed is the process template, the basic process template that is kind of a collection of all the best practices that we have collected in the past 10 years. So it contains a lot of the flows and, and decision making and, 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 and patterns that you would use for synchronizations. And then uh, we have a process installed for TAZ to JIRA. That's just a very small piece of configuration that um, that does the that does the uh, TZ to Jira connection itself um, those pieces usually are just uh, just um, just very small um, very small um, adjustments to the individual uh, tool uh, tool uh, tool setup um, all of that together um, is is what um, what is installed in symphony so for the uh, adapter, we do have um, conf different configurations in the background. I'll just jump into Jira maybe quickly. Um, so what we see here is the list of configuration sets that is pretty much like aliases for different environments. So with an adapter, you can uh, connect to as many Jira servers as you want. I have created a connection to my local Jira. And then there's usually a couple of required um, parameters that we have to specify, like where's Jira running and which user I'm going to use to. Um, of course, these configuration options are specific to, um, are specific to uh, uh, each adapter. So like for the TC, it looks a little bit different. I'll, like, it's a little different, like also in URL and stuff like that. And uh, so both adapters will allow us to connect to, to a number of um, environments in the background. Um, the same kind of concept we do have available for the process itself. So I'll just bring up the um, configuration for the process. I've created a configuration set demo. That is my demonstration project. In a real world, you would just see uh, a list of all your different projects that you're synchronizing with BMW here. Um, inside uh, the process configuration, what we see is, um, first of all, um, a parameter to decide which uh, JIRA we want to use, then a parameter 
that decides which TZ we're going to use. So we bring together my local Jira with the development TZ. Um, the other thing that we have to to uh, adjust here is uh, what project in Jira we want to use, and uh, also what uh, issue type in Jira we will use. Um, and then uh, we do have three different mapping scenarios. Um, so that covers the case in which there's a new um, business scenario. One item coming from BMW, so that means uh, BMW has detected a problem and reports it. Um, a mapping scenario in which uh, there was an update from BMW on such a, such a ticket. And then finally also a mapping for the scenario in which um, we are doing updates against the BS2 ticket. Those are tickets that we basically report back to BMW. Um, so that is um, more or less the configuration uh, for the integration itself. Um, inside the mappings, uh, we take a look at my scenario. It's pretty, it's pretty basic. I have decided to just synchronize the title from BMW with the summary in Jira, the error description with the description, and just like that, I could just bring up any kind. So this is the list of the BMW attributes, um, and I could then map them onto the Jira attributes, of course, depending on the individual configuration of the tool in the background. So that's what I do in the mapping module. Um, the final thing that is required um, in Symfony is what we call the scheduling. So I just set up one schedule here for my demo project. So um, it's run type setup um, where we can decide um, at what particular time of the day or on which days or how frequently um, the uh, process is running. So it's a pretty powerful configuration. I have just selected it to run every day at 10.15. And, um, and uh, of course, um, the processes could be also triggered from here if you want to if you want to manually have a process running. Um, the system itself also has what we call a diagnose page. Um, this is kind of a live view of what's going on in the Symfony platform itself. So what we're seeing here, the process is running right now. I just started it before, right before the before the webinar started. Uh, because we have a couple of new tickets from BMW, they all need to be synchronized, so I'm using the chance here. And what you can see is part of the Symfony transaction mechanism. So usually desynchronization runs in two different phases. First phase is uh, what we call the scoping, so it would just go back in that case to BMW and and um, and load the list of of tickets that have been not modified or, or newly created. And then Symfony just walks down that list. Um, this is what we call then the executes and then notifies the administrator about the progress and where we are. So you can see right now there's this succeeded, um, the succeeded counter is, is increasing. Um, at the time we speak, um, of course, the data is upgraded here in, uh, in Jira. So we are now at item 573. I just refresh for a minute and then we see okay, that's now 570 and so on. Um, of course, synchronization also addresses um, all aspects like, for example, attachments. Um, here in that case, those are the, uh, the automatically uh, created test tickets on the BMW uh, development environment. So that's why they have kind of this cryptic um, subject. So that's uh, pretty much everything um, from the from the very basics of how Symfony works. Um, there is a, a reporting module in the background. So this reporting module is there to just uh, collect the, uh, the errors. So we see some statistics in here. And would there be errors in the synchronization? They would show up in the reporting so that we can directly have a, we have a directly, we have a list of problems to be uh, resolved. Um, the rest of the um, the rest of the interface um, is then is then also pretty much for diagnose reasons. So if I jump to the system diagnose, this is kind of a landing page on which uh, I can check the health um, of the system itself. So if 
would on a regular basis try to check the connections to all the configured uh, systems and, and servers. So if I would uh, if I would see some problem in here, um, let me just jump here again. If I would see some problems here uh, coming up uh, with connections, you would see uh, you would see it here right away. Um, those kind of health information can of course also be integrated with typical monitoring uh, monitoring tools. Um, so that's pretty much um, pretty much everything um, that is required for a symphony setup, and that's how the synchronization basically works. So Ralph, I would then um, hand back to you. So um, as I think the last two slides we have here, some some additional features I would like to uh, to talk about very quickly. Um, so one is, um, as I mentioned already, um, that Symfony is also ready built for um, horizontal load balancing and, and clustering. So at the same time, this also uh, brings the failover technology. So if uh, you have at least two servers uh, for Symfony running, um, if one server should fail for, for whatever reason, the other one would automatically take over uh, all the load from from the first server or from defect server um, and if all servers are working of course they are sharing the load so that everybody runs in optimal performance mode um, and here uh, i just want to point out that um, of course uh, we can also um, synchronize context contextual information and uh, attachments so that means also probably hierarchies uh, of, of items and structuring information of, of these elements. Um, attachments is very important, of course. Also, we are supporting comments fields uh, and re uh, rich text um, uh, formatted text uh, for different products, of course. And the system is suitable for parallel processing. So it's not only one synchronization process running at one time. So that could be multiple here. And as Christian already so these could be event triggered, but also um, manually triggered, uh, like we did it here in this example, or maybe through through an event or an online event or whatever. So we have, have also different means here for that. And um, what is very important is, is the persistence. So uh, all the data that has been transferred between different um, systems here, we take kind of a copy in our internal database which but it's not a copy in, in in that sense that we are really copying the data but we are storing um, on the one hand side the id pairs so to say so the correlation between the defect in the supplier system and in the oem system that correlation we are storing um, and at the same time we are using um, also information through the synchronization processes um, to uh, to only change data, uh, exchange data which really has been changed between two synchronization runs. Uh, with we make use of checksums um, and and some data we are storing in our database. Uh, this in the end makes it really really uh, good in performance, um, and we do not have to exchange the data. Uh, twice or triple times or, or even more often uh, if in fact nothing has changed to the data. So now um, I think we are at the end of the webinar and uh, are open for your questions. So if there is anything you would like to ask, just looking to into the panel okay so I'm not sure Kristen if you can see the questions as well so here's one from um, looks like it's an existing customer is the reporting module and report features also available in the Java based on in the latest version of Symfony um, I would say yes of course and even even more um, we have planned uh, additional features uh, for the next version but i think christian you can 
Uh, yeah, the reporting mod module itself is in kind of a transitioning um, in a transitioning mode. So currently, uh, it is only um, it is only like uh, filled automatically by Symfony. So recommendation is to ex uh, to to export as much as possible um, information through the new process exception that we have built into Symfony 3.2. However, um, the capturing of the of the ROR reports is then done automatically. Um, so it's not really intended that the processes do fill the reporting. The underlying reason is that this has been misused in the past a lot of times for debugging reasons and then that fills the database with the information that we really didn't need. Um, so going forward, next release of Symfony is going to have a much more of a dashboard style feature. That's one of the big new items. I hope I can talk to that. Um, in a couple of um, couple of days or weeks, and, and and show a first impression of the new of the new version, and that is going to address most of the um, most of the uh, existing reporting needs. So we have been in talks with customers. If there is if there is more questions, um, I'm I'm more than happy to to discuss in more detail. Yes, thanks, uh, Christian. As already indicated, um, we will. As, as we could not do our uh, Argosense Connect um, conference uh, where we invite all our customers usually and uh, make uh, or show show previews of the upcoming releases, we will do that in the next week and months um, via via webinars. Um, so stay tuned for for the latest information regarding new new versions of our products. Um, of course, we will show them also live then in, in these webinars. Okay, so um, as I do not see any any other questions, um, I would like to thank you for your participation. If you should have any question after the webinar, don't hesitate to uh, contact us uh, via email, phone, or web form. Um, or directly through your maybe already established sales contact or through support, uh, depending on the kind of role you have. Um, this um, webinar um, has been recorded and you will uh, be provided with an email uh, containing a link to, uh, to the webinar recording and the slides we have shown um, in a few hours or maybe tomorrow. So, Again, thank you very much. Um, we have another webinar uh, the day after tomorrow. Um, and uh, if you'd like to participate, just look on our website um, for the registration formula. Um, and until then, um, I would like to thank you again and hopefully see and hear you next time. Bye bye.